person. Okay, I don't know and what that, your no, I don't I don't I can't speak to your position, but when I was working, I was a carpet cleaner. My girlfriend was pregnant and I had bills to pay. Going to school was not an option for me. So if I go on to like here's some advice to improve your position as a carpet cleaner. Oh, thank God. And the first thing is to go back to college. Well, f me. I've got a kid on the way, a house that I can barely afford, and I'm working as a carpet cleaner. That's like the worst thing to tell me. I'm not going back to school. My life is over. I so there's got to be something else. There has to be things we can tell poor people for how to improve rather than like no, but go to college. Yeah. Save. You don't need that extra latte, that extra streaming subscription, going to that fancy dinner. You want to put that in a money market account, earning five, maybe more percent. Okay, that's retarded. Hold on. Poor people are not opening money market deposit accounts. Okay. <laughs> That's, but it could be that he's just talking about like for like a like lower middle class or upcoming like student. In which case, yeah, never mind. That, it's better advice. I'm sorry. I just I made a big assumption about the audience he was directing that to. Or grow. Oh, Mark, Marky Q, you did not. So like this person looks like just based on her hair, clothes, and her background, this looks like a person that should be taking this advice. But <laughs> let's check. Not have to announce how much of an out of touch billionaire you are. You cultivated this persona of being like the people's billionaire. Oh, another thing that kind of sucks is MMDAs, <laughs> money market deposit accounts. Usually, at least like 15 years ago when I looked at these things, I think money market deposit accounts, don't they usually have fairly high minimum balances? Like, don't you need like $5,000 just to open a money market deposit account? Maybe that's changed in recent years. I'm not sure. Somebody can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but. Um, that would also be probably, I would imagine five grand is maybe prohibitively expensive for some people, but maybe not, I'm not sure. Um, people are saying not these days. Maybe they don't anymore, I don't know. But. Billionaire because of your prescription drug company. I guess when you're that out of touch, it's hard to be aware of it. Okay, so let's say that you get coffee once a week, every Friday. It's gotta be that brown sugar, oat milk, shake, and espresso, $6.15. You get that every Friday to celebrate getting through the week and to get you to that weekend. But not anymore because you decide that Mark has a real pulse on the working class and working poor. You decide to forego that little bit of happiness every week so at the end of the year you can have $295. All of that work, all of that denying yourself, and what do you have to show for it at the end of the year? Maybe, maybe you can buy Mark Cuban's shirt. But let's. Okay, a couple of things. Firstly, uh, for out of touch, it was funny that she made $300 of savings at the end of the year for foregoing one coffee sound like an insignificant amount of money. For some people, having an extra $300 cash, it actually is a decent chunk of money. So that's a little bit of a little bit of twinge of irony there um, that for her, $300 is just a throwaway. But also, secondly, I don't believe the issue is with people um, buying one cup of coffee on a Friday to celebrate getting through the week. I think the issue is people will make it a habit to go to these places where they are spending every single day or sometimes multiple times a day at places like that, right? I Again, I could be wrong. Maybe Mark Cuban is really critical, but if you're only getting one coffee a week on a Friday at Starbucks to celebrate getting through the week, my guess is gonna be most people would say, that's probably fine, you're okay. But if you're doing it every single day, because Starbucks is built into some people's daily routines, then you probably have an issue. Also, one coffee a week is not the start and stop of people's poor spending habits generally, but okay. Let's say you decide to invest it in a money market account. Like Mark suggested, you might get up to 5% interest. I mean, how much was the inflation in July? No, this is we're off to a great start. Why you would ever compare year over year inflation to the interest rate you would get in a money market deposit account. Not only one, not only is this nonsense, number two, you wanna know what's not keeping up with inflation? Is the coffee you drank. So, this is a really fucking retarded way to view the comparison between a money market deposit account versus buying coffee every Friday, but okay. But you hold strong because Mark said this was a great idea. So you don't have any more latte happiness for 10 years. How much money would you have? Would you look at that? That's probably enough for one month's rent in 10 years. No, no, but that was such good advice. Why is the issue? One month's rent is $4,410? Also, is that really all the money you would make off that? Let me check, investment calculator. She said in 10 years. Yeah, but for, oh, maybe 10 years from now, the average rent payment will be $4,400. I find that hard to believe, but it's possible. 
Um, if we start with zero, if we annually contribute, was it 350? She said $6 a week. Six times 52 is $312. And our rate of return is 5%, 10 years to grow. Okay, yeah, $4,000. Wait, starting out of zero. Oh, I have to start with a hundred bucks, okay. And in 10 years. No, no, but that was such good advice. Why is the issue always that the working class and the poor do something that costs $6 that brings- I don't like people like this. This is what I said. I'll say this a million times because it is true. Poor people love to be poor. People love to live poor and they do poor things. And this like constant like, oh, well, I just, I need to buy this thing and I need to have this thing and I need to spend money on this and blah, blah, blah. Listen, if you're getting one coffee a week or whatever, I think you're probably fine, okay? But the issue is, hold up. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hello, hello, hello. Amber Alert, Palm Beach County, kidnapped children. Hello? We have four children missing, an Amber Alert in, okay, the Maradiaga family, okay? Missing from Lake Worth, Florida, Florida, Palm Beach County. Check your phones if you're out there, guys. Okay, go out and grab these suckers. Okay. Brings them happiness. Why is the issue always that the working class and the poor do something that costs six dollars that brings them happiness every week? And not the fact that we have billionaires who are like modern day dragons just hoarding all the wealth. The issue is never framed as why does. What do you mean modern day dragons hoarding all the wealth? Like most of their wealth is just tied up in like the stock and the businesses they own. Should they divest their business and just give it all to, like it doesn't even make sense. Like. Mark Cuban have three homes, but nobody in the United States who makes minimum wage and works full time can afford the rent of a one bedroom apartment. And let's be for real, Mark doesn't actually believe that somebody's gonna become ultra wealthy or a billionaire because of this advice, but it is a great deflection from- That wasn't, I don't think his goal was, this is how you become ultra wealthy or an omega billionaire. I don't think that was the point of any of the advice that he gave. I don't think he would say as much. And the major flaws that are systemic within our capitalist system. Oh, capitalism. And I used to eat this stuff up when I was in my early 20s. I'd look at the 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 50 year olds and be like, wait a second, they were working really hard and they have nothing. How is that happening? And people like Mark would swoop in and be like, oh, it's because they don't wake up at 5 a.m. They don't only sleep for 30 minutes at a time. They don't. Mark gave like what sounded like really basic, decent financial advice, just super basic stuff. Just be careful, like limit your spending on stuff that you don't really need that can like, especially stuff like food, like you eat it and then you're done with it in 30 minutes, you know? Don't only eat white bread and they just aren't grinding. Grind, grind, until you wake up one day in your 30s and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. This isn't about grinding. This system is incredibly flawed because there's always gonna be something in your life that you do that brings you a little bit of happiness or distraction and it costs a little bit of money. And the billionaires can point to that and be like, see, that's the reason you're not me. I mean. Maybe Mark is right, because in the time that I've taken to make this TikTok, I have not had any brown sugar, oat milk, shake, and espressos, and I am, in fact, now a hundred thousand air. Jesus Christ. Looks like today was a big day. How'd it go? Um, you know, it's okay. All right. The, yeah, I have no idea how much you follow my stuff, so I don't know. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was a fun times, fun times. Guess we're about, guess we're about to find out, huh? <laughs> I, I guess so. Okay. All right. Do you want to introduce yourself, everybody? Yeah. Hey, I'm Lindsay, or Socialistly Awkward. I my main platform is TikTok. I also have Instagram, Twitter. I'm a nurse in Idaho. Uh, a lot of my content is about Idaho. We've got a lot of extremists, a lot of fascists, white supremacists. So, a lot of my content is about what they're doing in the state and healthcare mm. stuff. Just you know, standard. But that's what I do. Gotcha. All right. And then I'm Stephen Bonnell, aka Destiny, Scrum at People Online. Uh, we've gone back and forth on that a little bit, and we are currently in a disagreement, or have had a disagreement over, I guess, some interpretations of a Mark Cuban clip. Yeah, that that appears to be what it is. Yeah. Um. Okay. Here. So. <clears throat> but. Um. I'm just curious, how, what is your, um, what's your like, for as much as you're comfortable with, can you kind of tell me your financial upbringing or like your trajectory from birth to where you're at now? Like generally, were you like middle class, upper class, lower class, and it, as, as comfortable as you want, if you don't want to reveal anything too, too personal, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Oh. Oh no, it's fine. I'm 
Yeah. I'm an open book. Um, so I grew up extremely poor, really, really poor. Um, my family, my dad did labor work, construction, things like that. Um, like just incredibly poor. Like my eye exams when I was little, my dad would take us to the job site and, and there was uh, an Indian reservation near our house and they would have free eye exams every so often. So that's where we get our eye exams. Um, back to school shopping was thrifting, not like full vintage thrifting. Like here you get 40 bucks, make it work. Um, you know, just kind of that. Like Christmas wasn't spectacular. I grew up Mormon. And so there was something called the Bishop's Storehouse. And my parents would go pick things from the Bishop's Storehouse that then we could have for Christmas presents. So when I was like 13, I would get like cookbooks or, you know, whatever people had donated. Um, but yeah, that's just, that's really poor, good stamps, all the welfare, everything, not, not a lot of money. Um, but my, it wasn't like, because my dad didn't work hard, capitalism just isn't his game. Like he really personified work doesn't make you wealthy, money makes you wealthy because he always was grinding, always working. Um, and then as a, as a young adult, I was poor, working poor, um, going to college on Pell Grants. I uh, spent most of my adult life working for, I'm middle class or middle middle class or lower middle class, depending on where you look now. So that's kind of generally where I've been. Okay, gotcha. Okay, cool. All right, just, okay, seeing what page we're on here. Do you think that, I'm curious, do you think that poor people generally have bad spending habits or no? God, I was waiting for this question. Um, for, first, I want to ask, what do you mean by poor? Like, do you mean poverty? Do you mean like paycheck to paycheck working poor? Do you mean just like we'll say like we'll say like middle class paycheck, upper middle class? We'll and... say like paycheck to paycheck worker. Okay. Um. So I think you can say that because data does back that up but i think it's incredibly reductive of the holistic experience of being poor and what that entails and what that looks like and how they're responding to their environment i mean like it's expensive to be poor and they deal with oh <laughs> do you not believe it's expensive to be poor in some ways it is in some ways it absolutely isn't it just depends on what exactly we're talking about do you mind like clarifying what like um when we say ways? that it's expensive yeah. to be poor an example of it's expensive to be poor uh, might mean that uh, my car is in a state of disrepair so it's more likely to suffer some sort of damage when it gets damaged i have to call a tow truck if i can't afford the tow truck it gets impounded and every day there's more fees breaking up um, and i don't have the ability to get to work and everything compounds because i don't have the ability to um, ameliorate my circumstances immediately with some with just having money um, any little problem snowballs yeah. into like a catastrophe instantly that's an example of sometimes yeah. it's expensive to be poor an example that i don't believe in for instance is like the fabrication of say food deserts or the idea that healthy food is unavailable to poor people. I think that's an entire mythology fabricated by middle class and upper class people that think that poor people don't know how to cook or incapable of it. Um, so it just depends on when we say it's expensive to be poor. In some ways, I 1 million percent agree. In other ways, I think it's um, a little bit of a, an autonomy robbing of poor people and it's like an infantilization of them. It just depends on what we're talking about. I mean, do you, so what, like just back to the food thing. I get what you're saying about the food deserts and the cooking, but like considering like paycheck to paycheck people, what do you think about the fact like, you know, par both parents are working, they're coming home late, they've got kids, like just saying just cook your food isn't always as simple as saying just cook your food. It's not that they're lazy, it's not that they don't want to, it's that that's not always available for them in the amount of hours they have in a day as much as they would like. And so, Yes, it is cheaper to just buy ingredients and cook food, uh, but that's not always available to the working poor. I feel like if you as I feel like if you math it out, that's just never going to be the case. Um, like to get healthy food, and we're not even talking like a, like fifty million different types of green vegetables and everything to 
create to cook healthy food is probably not only is it cheaper in the long run, it's also time efficient. Like if we're saying that like we're working so many hours in the day that we have to go to uh, fast food at the end of the day, and single people don't even realize fast food for a single person might be uh, anywhere, from, geez, depending on where you go, anywhere from five to fifteen dollars. But if you're feeding like a family of four. You're looking at potentially north of you know forty fifty dollars for a meal every single night, for however much you're working. Take an hour off and go home and cook. Like whatever time you spend working, you're going to save that money probably fivefold or tenfold just buying some simple ingredients and cooking food at home. But well, I guess maybe you and I have. I'm not always saying they go out to eat fast food because I agree with you. It is not cheap for a family. Not even like the options that used to be cheap, like McDonald's. It's not cost effective to do that Mm -hmm. but like it's significantly cheaper to have like a stofer as you pop in the oven that's significantly more time efficient than making lasagna especially if you just come off like a 12-hour shift but in the long run that's not healthier which contributes to more health issues which we know people who are poor are more likely to have Mm -hmm. and it it costs more to buy the ingredients to make a lasagna than to often buy a Sofer's lasagna and just make it work. I mean, it's it, my understanding it's complicated. is it's I, it's it's it kind of is complicated if you have zero background cooking whatsoever. But I think that without any systemic changes, without any structural shakeups, without any additional education or work opportunities, teaching an individual to cook all else equal, will probably confer a good financial benefit to them and a good health benefit to them. That it is a skill that is learnable. It's not that hard. Um, it might be intimidating if you have no experience, but no, it's not- I agree. Th- yeah. Okay, cool. All right. But I do agree that there are a whole bunch of reasons um, generationally, I guess, if your parents are busy, they don't teach you to cook, you grow up, you don't know how to cook, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of like the generational poverty in terms of habits that can manifest from parent to child. But- some, something that's frustrating, uh, you said this before, that it's incredibly reductive to talk about how poor people have bad spending habits. I I feel like you can make that exact argument the other way. When I argue with a lot of progressives, it feels like any time you try to give advice for how to escape poverty, they go, it's reductive, that's reductive, that's reductive. And then you go, oh, okay, well, then what's the answer? Complete and total systemic revolutionary change of the entire system. It's like, well, that feels kind of reductive. Um, circling back to the Mark Cuban clip, I feel like it's okay to give advice to poor people and say, like, hey, um, a lot of you spend your money in really shitty ways, which is just true, which is demonstrably true, and to say you could spend your money or allocate it a bit differently and probably get, like, a big savings, and it just feels silly that every time somebody provides, like, any good advice, which it is, people have to pop and be like, oh, well, that's not fixing all of capitalism, and it's like, well, yeah. No, but I mean, that wasn't my critique of the clip, that it isn't fixing all of capitalism. But that, Um, but your critique, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I my I have a question for you though. Like from your response, I don't know if you have it on hand or if it matters, but your response to, to me, I don't remember which video, but one of the responses was basically, well, this like upper middle class rich bitch is giving financial advice that's out of touch of her. So like if I do it, it was out of touch and unacceptable. If Mark Cuban, a billionaire does it, that's more acceptable. Like, yeah, the reason why I thought his advice was more in touch is because his advice tracks one million percent with poor people wasting money on stupid shit. And for I, I felt like for you to say, well, if we just get rid of our one coffee a week, that like if if a, if the average poor person's financial proclivities were to just buy one coffee at Starbucks a week, the majority of them would be probably in a decently improved financial position. This isn't, again, enough to like upend the system or anything. But I mean, there are a number of ways that poor people, whether we're talking utilization of credit cards, whether we're talking payday loans, whether we're talking like rent to own or layaway, um, there's all sorts of, or buying cars that they probably don't need or leasing cars, stuff like that. There's a lot of ways that poor people use money where it's like, just spend a little bit differently and you can significantly improve your financial situation. And you can have like a path towards like starting to climb out of, you know, the bad situation you're in potentially, depending again on like how, how much, how deep we're in here or what your actual income is. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I don't all the way disagree. I think that those are examples of why it's expensive to be poor like 
there's I, I'm not going to make a generalization about an entire group of people like poor people are this or poor people are that because it's a whole lot of different people with a whole lot of background and different experiences living in different ways with different sets of values and expectations for life. But I think those were examples of why it's expensive to be poor. And I mean, like, like if we're going to be like really real, like fucking for real, Mark's advice wasn't for poor people because at the end of the day, if it is that one copy or even let's two, let's say it's $600 a year. Well, it's not like nobody who is nobody is nobody. Okay. But nobody with, Six hundred dollars. We can even like twelve hundred. They aren't getting a money market account. Like poor people aren't investing in money market accounts. That's not happening. So who is this advice for? Is it for I, poor people? Well, it could it be for, for students. It could be for lower middle class people. It could be. I mean, it could be for a variety of people. It depends. But again, what you just said there, if a poor person's like horrible spending was just limited to two coffees a week. We would be in a whole different ballgame, but it's not. I feel like poor people's financial realities revolve around highly depreciating assets, meaning buying vehicles that are way too expensive, usually with outrageous terms because they already have horrible credit. So 60-month-plus loans at 5% plus interest with all the gap insurance and every other you know thing that the car deal and, you know, sold them. Um, oftentimes, it's picking inappropriate dwellings, like renting an apartment that the cost of rent is too close to uh, where they can suffer an emergency. Uh, oftentimes for lower middle class people, it can be things like lifestyle creep. So you start to make a little bit more money and you get a second car. Uh, everything that I'm saying, these are just examples of ways that poor people spend money that are so horrible for their financial situation. And these things can be improved with stupid TikTok clips like Mark Cuban or basic financial education like Caleb Hammer or other people on YouTube or TikTok or whatever. And I, it, it's frustrating to me when somebody gives advice like that, it's like, hey, don't waste your money, unironically, on avocado toast or too much Starbucks or whatever, because you can blow through hundreds of dollars a month on stuff like this without realizing it. And then the response is always like, oh, well, I don't want to generalize poor people. Why not? We can super generalize poor people. We can generalize all sorts of people. That's why that's why science exists, right? Let's, that's why we have economics and sociology. Like, we can generalize spending habits and, and saving habits and everything of tons of groups of people. Um, and it's frustrating that it's impossible to give any sort of advice without it getting countered with this, like, well, what about capitalism thing? I think, like, you just listed all the ways that it's expensive to be poor. Like, they usually have poor credit. Like, that, that makes their life infinitely more expensive like as somebody who's lived on the edge for years and years and years and years when you're living on the edge like that you're not buying store-bought coffee you're not buying store-bought coffee often it's a treat like there's there's not that money to waste because there's not that money you already know you make to the dollar what you need to pay your bills there's no wiggle room there's no excess and so it when you're like as somebody who's lived in that position when you are on the edge constantly one that's super fucking stressful all the time you're dealing with stress all the time so we could also have a conversation about when you are stressed all the time living day to day you aren't thinking long term you aren't mm -hmm. we, we already know that studies have shown that you're not thinking long term you're living day to day to day to day and you also don't always think about things logically because it's not available to you like you are living in a constant state of stress. Not that you can't ever, but not that you always will. I, I agree and with what so, you're saying. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. But like when we say it's it's expensive to be poor, I'm thinking of kind of like the intractable ways, like where if you're poor, you're fucked. So in my opinion, things like it can be major home repairs, necessary ones. So like, for instance, your AC breaking, or I'm sorry, your heater breaking in the wintertime. I live in the Midwest. Um, it could be yeah. cracking a wheel, blowing a tire, um, or some sort of like minor car accident, or it could be, uh, God forbid, some sort of health problem. These are things where like, if you're poor, not only are you hit with a big bill, it's going to snowball into horrible shit. Um, and it's almost yeah. unavoidable yeah. if you don't have the financial reserve. But things like poor credit, there's not... A, you shouldn't have poor credit just because you're poor. Poor credit shows that you are misappropriating your spending or you're not understanding the amount of money available to you. Um, now, I'm generalizing from personal experience here, and I could be wrong, but I'd be shocked if I was. Um, when you talk about how like poor people are budgeting all their money and they're doing exactly as they can, that was not my experience or the experience of other poor people around me. Generally, the 
you have your, it's almost like you're bipolar when you're poor and that you have this manic phase where the paycheck hits the bank and for like three or four days, you're living large. You might pay if you're late on a cell phone bill or something, you get your phone turned back on, you pay a few bills and then you spend like pretty dumbly. And then as you start to hit those final like four or five, six days, like your second week and you're waiting for the next paycheck, then maybe you dip into the negatives because of poor planning, you get hit with bounce fees. Maybe you pull out that credit card, you start swiping because you don't have money for it. But a lot of it comes down to kind of like the poor, like you said, the poor long-term planning of poor people when it comes to spending. But I don't think that's like an like it built into a poor person's brain. I think it's because they don't ever learn good money management or spending habits. And one of the ways you can learn those good spending habits is by making a budget and seeing where all of your extra money is going and showing that maybe you don't need to buy, you know, three or four or five fast food meals or DoorDash something just because you just got a paycheck and it just hit your bank account. Or you're in one of those lucky months where you got three paychecks and now you're going to buy a TV and like finance the other half of it, you know? No, and I like I... I just, I don't, that was not my experience, but I don't, I'm not going to say that's not everybody's experience because I come from multi-generational poverty and that was how my grandparents were. Uh, like that, that was absolutely how they lived. And so that is how some people live, but poor people also have poor credit going back to that point because in a lot of instances, they haven't had a chance to build up their credit. Like you, you have to have the ability to buy things that require credit to build your credit. Yeah, but that's, you can also, if you have money to buy things, you can just get a cheap credit card. You can get a credit card with a $500 limit and just spend it and pay it off every month, right? You don't have to make a lot of money. You don't really have to change any of your spending habits at all to build credit, I don't think, even as a poor person. I mean, like, if you're young and poor, yet, like, my very first car, I, it was a 1995 Honda Civic, I saved up $1,000, it was a $3,000 car, and I was going to the bank, going to all the banks, I was like 19 or 20, I didn't have any credit, not any credit in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And so I needed someone to co-sign for me to be able to buy that car. Even though I could put a third down, the payment was gonna be teeny tiny, I could absolutely pay it, because I, I just didn't, I didn't have credit. Yeah. Because I grew up, I grew up with a Dave, Ramsey family where it was like don't ever have debt no matter what and which I think is very problematic to teach people I but agree. like we could have a whole other we could have a whole other conversation about how our people don't know about money so they don't know how to teach their kids about money they don't know about connections they uh -huh. don't know about investing like that that is also part of the whole like holistic it's not necessarily that they want to spend their money poorly they don't know how to spend their money i agree but that's um, part of where the dumb mark cuban tiktok videos and everything come in where it's like i don't think you can just say like oh no it's expensive to be poor we can't do anything because even the problem that you just mentioned about having trouble uh getting credit for your first car that could have been something where mark cuban could make a video and go like hey guys if you've got kids um i don't know if they still offer this they did like 20 years ago when i was a kid but you can take your child into a bank and you can get them a secured credit card where you open a checking account you throw in 300 bucks and then they've got a credit card credit card that's building credit for them but it's linked to a checking account that works as basically collateral for the line of credit so there's never any real risk to the bank and so that your child is like regularly making payments and building credit so like that would be another example of like a video that you could just shoot to a poor person and without any big change in their life they can be helping their child build credit and again like if you've got money to pay your bills and do all your normal things like month to month you can be building credit like there's no reason to have bad credit save for a, like a catastrophe in your life like the vast majority of poor people if i had to guess with any data the vast majority of poor people with bad credit did it because they made shitty spending decisions not because a catastrophe popped up and wiped them out I, but like, if Mark Cuban made that video, I wouldn't say anything because that is actual good advice for poor people. That like that. You don't I think, think so? Telling somebody advice. to like I, not I, buy like a ton of coffee or go to Starbucks every day or like I like I knew people that. But would he get, didn't. But yeah. that's. We're good. But that's not what he said. He said, "Don't buy that extra latte or that extra streaming service." Like it wasn't even about the coffee. But if we're going to nitpick, he said the extra, the extra. So, so everyone wants to talk about like, oh, is everybody who gets two Starbucks a day? Like, I have coworkers who do that. Yeah, I'm not like, that's not what he said though. But that's, I mean, say, that's what like, he if mean. You're buying that's what he's not talking about one coffee. Like for whatever education level he has, he's a billionaire. I'm sure he can do the math and he probably knows that one coffee a week is not making or breaking almost anybody's bank. But I don't think poor people are getting one coffee a week. I think there are poor people that probably get like 
two Starbucks orders a day. I think that's the issue that he's probably talking about. That I don't know if he mentions buying like store coffee in that video or if I'm thinking of another person. But like, there are ways that people spend money every single day where they're just like not even aware of how much is just completely disappearing from their wallet because they're buying, yeah, you know, like multiple trips to fast food places every single day or door dashing or other like dumb ways to spend their money. I don't disagree that people are some like some people are not good at budgeting or assessing how much they are hemorrhaging on little things every month. I don't disagree. I also don't think that this was advice targeting poor people. Like the majority of the comments coming in who were like, of course this wasn't for poor people. Of course this is for people who are going to have $10,000 if they save up or $15,000 who have $20,000 extra dollars if they save 15% of their income, 20% of their income. That, that's my issue is everyone made this video who they wanted it to be for. And I don't necessarily think it is universal advice for everyone in the same way. Like I, I, I have people that I know that make two hundred thousand dollars a year and blow through their money in really stupid ways. Uh -huh. And yeah, absolutely, they could probably start saving their money and put fifty thousand down in a money market account every single year, and that would make a huge difference in their life. I agree. I, I'm not going to argue that could be advice for them. But I, I think, again, like, talk about how, how poor people are doing all of these things. I, that's not what I'm seeing. Like, I, I live in a poor neighborhood. I, it's old. I live, I work with middle class people. I, like, I, my, I'm the richest sibling of my siblings by far. And I see how they live. And there's just not this extra money. Like, I'm not saying they don't spend things that aren't that they could save every single penny. But I also, I also think it is, I don't know, there's just something so just completely fucked up in our society where the wealth gap has gotten enormous. The middle class is shrinking. Like the uh, wages have been stagnant for decades. And a billionaire is like, so here's the thing, you should buy less stuff, which I mean, if we want to talk about markets, he does want people to continue to spend because people continue to spend outrageously has helped with inflation and keeping us out of a recession. That's a whole different conversation. But just like there's, there's something about, I don't know, like he needs to read the room. Not that giving financial advice is bad, but like read the room. Everybody, like there is mass discontent at this point with how things are going. And so a billionaire just, just saying this, like on its face saying like, you should save money. I'm not against saving money. I'm not against encouraging people to find ways to save money, but there's just something so rich of about a billionaire saying like, just give up all these things, give up these little things or what he thinks are little things, give up these things. So you can have a money market account, which most money market accounts, you need a fair amount of money to get started anyway. Sure. Uh, back in my day, it was, it was like a $5,000 minimum limit. I think the limits are lower today, especially if you do online banking. I'm not entirely sure. I, I don't I don't disagree with the idea that something more needs to be done, but it's, it's just Mark Cuban. He's not even in Congress. Like It's not like he's about to change the structure of anything in the United States or make education free or do anything, right? So I, I just don't understand like the... If he gives advice... Like, if anybody listens to Mark Cuban's advice, their life can only be improved. Either they're wasting less money on random things, uh, or they hear it and they just ignore it. But it's not like he's actively harming anybody. It's good advice for most people. Like, in my personal opinion, if you're ever trying to help somebody escape poverty, the very, very, very first thing you do before you've done anything else is you say, okay, hey, let's sit down and make a budget. Same thing with the person trying to lose weight. What do we do? We're going to start counting our calories. Um, you know, like writing stuff down and seeing it in front of you is like the step one most important thing. And then trimming the fat on, you know, do you have a Netflix and a Hulu and an Amazon Prime account? Do you need all of these? Uh, you know, do you have two or three cell phone lines? Like, can you get rid of one? Do you need to buy the new phone and be making extra payments on it every month? Like these types of savings are, you know, 20, 30, 50, 60, 70 dollars bi-weekly can be like big savings for people depending on the amount of money they make. And the idea that every single conversation about financial well-being has to be about like 
ending capitalism or some huge grandiose thing. I, it feels very tiring and it feels like it, that feels disconnected, I think. Like, I, I think it's sexy to go to poor people and be like, hey, like, don't you guys want to have a revolution? And it's like, okay. But that doesn't, that actually doesn't do anything for anybody. It doesn't help anybody. It's probably not happening anytime soon. As opposed to like, hey, here's some real like on the ground financial advice. You know, don't spend your money in these ways. Stay away from credit cards. Stay away from high interest loans. Like these really basic pieces of advice can dramatically improve a person's life probably way before any huge systemic change is going to be on the way. But I mean, like, I, I don't, it's like, I don't disagree that teaching people the budget isn't a bad thing. I, I'm saying, like, literally, if it had been any, like, anybody who's not a billionaire, is like, hey, budget. Why, why does him like, being a billionaire it, matter? Why does that matter? <laughs> because it's giving, it's giving Marie Antoinette, like, let them eat cake, let them, let them invest, let them, like, it's, Again, I think it's reductive of the scenarios people are, are seeing. Like, every, but it's not reductive. It's been... a wealthy guy. Like, why would you not? Like, there, nothing he's saying is wrong. Are you just mad that he's a billionaire? He's giving the advice, or no? I just think it's it's tone. Like I said before, I didn't say that the advice itself is bad. I said it's tone deaf. No, you and said the is. advice. I, I to be fair, you said the advice was bad. That was the whole point of your little math charting is to show that you actually save no money by paying attention to your spending habits. You, you said the advice was bad, but now you, it seems like you're saying the advice is okay. You just don't like it because it was toned up. I don't think I said. I don't think I said the advice was bad. I said it was out of touch. And by out of touch, you mean it was then, correct, but I, because he's a billionaire, he shouldn't have been the one to give that advice. It should come from a poor person or a millionaire. Or no, I'm not saying it has to come from. No, I'm not saying it has to come from a poor person. I'm just saying with the reality of what we're facing and then mark cuban saying like hey like just everything everything about it was so tone deaf and and just showing like be, growing up with the dave ramsey like it felt like the dave ramsey the avocado toast like blaming poor people for existing in the system that they exist in and, and there are things that they can do to change it. But the reality of the situation is there are major systemic issues that are why they're in that situation. It's not, it's not just that because they're spending, like literally it's, wages have been stagnant for 30 plus years. That is a major factor in why people don't have disposable income. And, I, I mean, like millennials are living with less accumulated wealth than their parents, than Gen X. And the same thing is going to happen to Gen Z. Like, it, it was a TikTok. The point of the TikTok wasn't coffee. It wasn't the advice. It was the billionaires are out here like, hey, you could save money and have extra cash, which in and of itself isn't wrong or bad. But saying that in the face of where we are as a society right now, like the realities of the shrinking middle class and the poor and those living paycheck to paycheck, like, I, I'm not going to give him props for like kind of giving advice. He could give a whole lot of really good advice if he wanted to. Like he, he could he could talk about major investments, how to work them, how to really plan for retirement. Like he could give super quality advice. Okay, but I feel like I mean I feel like we're 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 I feel like we're ad hogging this a little bit or, or we're being a little bit I feel like he could have made a video saying, listen um, if you want to be successful in retirement, here's the ways to invest for it or plan for it. Take advantages of 401ks and IRAs. And I feel like you would have made the same stitch going, Mark Cuban, people don't have 401ks and IRAs anymore. The middle class is shrinking. There are no more pensions. Like People need to figure out how to be able to afford their rent. They're not saving for retirement. You're completely out of touch. I feel like you could have made the exact same arguments for any of those pieces of advice. I mean, but I did. I, I mean, you can say that, but I didn't. Well, obviously, I, like, because that wasn't what he gave. But I'm just saying, like, you could using. I'm just saying, all of your logic maps on perfectly here. Like, oh, Mark Cuban, the billionaire, giving investing advice. How much money do you put into your 401k, Mark Cuban? Well, I can only afford fifty dollars uh, a month in my 401k. Let's do the math and see how much it saves up. And oh, it's not much. Like, I feel like we could use all the exact same arguments for why we're saying he's out of touch giving this advice here for him giving literally any advice. Like, outside of like doing like startup or angel investing. Like, I don't know what advice a billionaire could give. That would be like in his wheelhouse that you wouldn't feel like is out of touch. If he if he can't even say something as simple as like, hey, like trim the fat from your budget, which I think is like a pretty basic I think most people would recommend that, from billionaires all the way down to other poor people that yeah you know, are, are trying to, to modify their spending habits. 
I mean, if like, did you watch the other video, the other half um, of his advice? I I watched whatever was because there, there was a prolonged video. Like the first one went really viral. The second one like did average. Uh, there was more to the advice. Like it wasn't just about saving. Like his other advice was work really hard and people will appreciate you at work and give you more money. And like, I don't know, may, that might be good advice from the 80s. That's not real. Like that, that well, is what do you mean reality. by that's not real? If you work harder at work, they're going to make you do multiple people's work. They're not going to pay you more. They don't pay you more the harder you work. That's, first of all, the, depending on where you work, raises are, your job performance is absolutely going to be factored into potential raises and everything. Now, if you want to talk about taking on more responsibility without pay, there's another conversation to be had about um, you know, like negotiating salary or negotiating wages and stuff. But like working harder in general is probably going to be better for compensation at work. No? Do you think that's completely un impossible or that is not the reality that i've seen i mean in the industries i've worked no but which are the industries of the paycheck to paycheck the poor and so what's an example of a job where if you work harder you're 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 not going to make any more money or you're not going to see any promotions or a nurse Aren't... nursing teaching social workers so Teaching is probably true. Social work is probably true. Like government jobs is probably true because of the way that they're... Um, yeah, because of how they're structured. Yeah. But I feel like for... When I think of like the... like If I think of like retail and service jobs, that's where I'm going to when I'm thinking of like super working part, but maybe we can upgrade a little bit. But when I think of like retail and service jobs, I feel like those are the jobs where you're the most likely to get promoted if you show up on time, if you do a really good job, especially because a lot of places like that, like McDonald's and stuff will do a promotion from within. So if you want to be like a team lead or a supervisor or a manager, usually working hard is what gets you through those positions. I don't know about like... I don't know for teachers if you can work harder for a wage because of the, the structures of school and teachers unions and everything, but... Um, I think in general, working but harder I've, is... Like, yeah. I've, Go ahead. I've worked fast food and I've worked retail and I've been man like managers in both and it literally... Working harder meant they didn't hire people because I was covering up that slack and so they weren't going to hire more people. Like that... Like I, I've worked fast food and been made a manager and I got no raise until I complained and then like a year later... I got it. Like they promoted hard, you. Hold on, wait, wait. You got promoted from supervisor to manager, and it didn't come with a substantial pay increase. No, it was fast food. Okay, that seems impossible. Um, I don't know how you. I that. Okay. Um, I mean, it was no. It was. I went from. I was working Subway. I was night supervisor to night manager. And they didn't pay. Oh, fuck. Wait, what just died? I mean, 10 cents. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, and I wait. mean, I've worked oh. retail. Mm -hmm. oh. Sorry, my thing lagged for a bit. I think we I've cut worked... a little bit. No, no, you're totally fine. Let me know when you're ready. Yep, yeah, go for it. Um, I've also worked retail, and that wasn't the case. Either. Like, working harder didn't get me bonuses, didn't get me promotions didn't get anything. Do you, like, do you I, think... I just don't think that that is the reality. I, I mean, it could be, I, I'm not saying it isn't in any industries. I'm <laughs> saying it in these industries where you have people working paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. That's not the reality. Do you think in general, do you think supervisors or managers get paid more than like line workers, like normal lowest level? I think employees? That they're probably the, they're supposed to. Do you think on average, if we averaged the wages of like a supervisor and a manager, that the manager would make more than the supervisor or that the supervisor would make more than like the normal, like front? I think on average we could, but like, I don't always think that's because they have worked hard. Like, like in my experience, it's who is available and hiring from the inside. Like, unless, I mean, things might've changed. I haven't worked retail or fast food in you know, like 12 years, but it wasn't always hiring within. Uh, that was not the way they did it. Okay, so I'm that just was not the reality that I saw. 
Sure. What do you think if you're talking to a group of poor people and you're trying to get them to improve their lot in life? I, I guess like, what is your go-to advice? Like, how would you try to help like a group of people like this? Like, what are the things that you're saying? Or what do you think is the advice that should be given? I mean, I well, I mean, first of all, I I think a big part of it is not not. I have to preface this with other things. Yeah. I think so much of its structure or the advice that's given is it is your fault. So I think like one of the things that was really empowering to me, and I know like conservatives hate this, maybe you'll hate this, like hearing like this isn't your fault. You were born into these circumstances. And so it's not your fault. You've had to just grind and scrape and get here. There are systemic issues, but here are things that can help. I think that is really powerful. This whole, like, like I did the grind thing. My husband and I did the grind thing in our early twenties. Like you got to get up at six. You got to be journaling. You got to be donating plasma to get extra money. Like we were thrifting at thrift stores to resell on Amazon. Like everything, every moment was hustle, 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 side business, get another thing going, get another thing going. You've got to get like, find some way to get your income stream up to get that disposable income. And ultimately, the really the only thing that made the financial difference for us was finishing college, having a degree, and being able to get a job that paid more because of that degree. So I, I mean, my advice would be there needs to be significant. And, and I mean, we already know that people who have parents who have college degrees are more likely to get college degrees, which is why there is so many vast differences in education between those who are extremely poor and not. And I'm not saying college is the only way you can make money. I, I, I know that's not true, but that is true for a lot of people and a lot of these paycheck to paycheck people to get them into something where they can make more on average. That, that still is the reality, even if it's not true for everyone or a trade or something like overhauling that focusing on career technical education, focusing on schooling. Um, I think like one of the biggest things we could do is make that kind of education significantly more affordable for people. I think that would change things for so many people. Like that, that sure. So, okay. So one of the things that I hear often stated is when you talk to people on the right, all of the control, about a person's life, the, the determining factors are all resting within that person. If you're doing poorly in life, it's your fault. If you want to improve your lot in life, you know, the sky's the limit, it's up to you to work for it. And then one of the things I hear about people yeah. on the left is you are powerless and hopeless, you can't do anything. You, we need big structural change, big systemic changes, otherwise you're kind of like screwed. And I guess the thing that I, I, I would hope to push for is we have to find a way to marry these two ideas because it's always going to be both in combination that end up working at the end of the day, and it can't be one without the other. So, like I was asking you, what are things that we would tell a group of poor people in order to improve their financial standings? And what I heard was get a college degree, get parents with a college degree, or make education more affordable. All of these things are largely outside of like a poor person's life once they've entered the workforce. And then ironically enough, the way that you improved your lot in life was actually by working harder. It sounds like you worked and did school at the same time and then got a degree and then that's how you were able to escape your situation. So I feel like your personal life actually fully coincides with the advice of like, it is your fault, figure it out. And then you did do that. You went to school and you figured it out and now you're reasonably successful. But then when you're giving advice to other poor people, um, now you're saying that like, well, if your parents don't have a degree and if you don't already have a degree, you better hope we make education free. Otherwise you're kind of like screwed is what, that's what it feels like. Unless I'm, yeah, that, I'm missing. Cause I, I was just curious. No. Cause I'm curious. Like what is your advice to 25 year old person? They're now in the workforce. They're past school. Like what is the advice you give to these people to help them, you know, improve their position financially? I mean, unionize, but <laughs> well, again, that, that would be. No, but that I like no, but that is really real. Like that that is no, like I get that that's not the advice you want to hear, but I didn't I didn't it is a myth that I worked harder now or that I worked harder to get to school than I worked previously. I, I think retail and fast food was 
some of the hardest I work with caveats because healthcare can be a bitch. But I, I don't think that now and when I was going to school, I was working significantly harder than I worked then. There was just not the upward mobility. And, and I, I think that is like upward mobility is tied to systemic issues. Like, like that's the thing, like we have to be real about that. Like that's not, we, we can talk about like, what advice would you give a person day to day to day? But that was my whole point is giving that day to day to day advice, grind, you know, deny yourself this, that, and the other, don't have it um, without a, a very frank conversation about the systemic issues and what needs to happen to change those issues does a disservice to people in poverty. I, I absolutely think it does. And and I think it it places more of the blame on them, which I, I think is completely unfair. You say, I, I don't think that they're working. I understand that you say blame, but you can also view it as like some level of autonomy. Like I understand that it, I, I disagree with this notion that every time you give advice, it has to come with an addendum of the 52 different structural issues that also have to accompany said advice to change things. You know, like, um, if you don't want your car to get broken into, how can you prevent that? Well, okay, well, first, I hope in the 1900s your parents owned a house, and then let's start from there. Like, it feels like everything has to be this overwhelming structural thing. There has to be a way to just be able to say, like, hey, if you're poor, don't ever fucking DoorDash food, ever. Don't ever do that. It's a waste of money. I feel like we should be able to say that without everybody dogpiling somebody like, well, can you really say that? Are you a billionaire? Like, you don't want people to ever door dash? You want people to be miserable and never have fast food and that's only for the bourgeois and blah, blah, blah. I feel like, I think we agreed. Mark Cuba's advice was fine. Like, you're recommending things. Like, you said unionize as a way to improve your wages. One of the examples that you gave were teachers who are unionized and make horrible money. Um, it just, it feels like, it feels like at the end of the day, when I listen to you speak about poor people and you say like, oh, well, what we're doing is we're, you know, so mean the way we talk to them. And then you take all agency away from these people to be able to improve any part of them. And you say, listen, wait for the huge systemic change or the huge structural changes, because other than that, you're completely boned. It feels like there's no type of advice or situation you'd be comfortable giving or telling poor people or having somebody else tell poor people without feeling like it's irresponsible to do so without advocating for the wider systemic change. Well, but no, but I think it does them a disservice to say like i think only focusing on that does them a disservice i mean yeah but wait do you think mark cuban if, when you say only focus on that do you think mark cuban thinks you shouldn't get educated or there shouldn't be like different tax brackets or there shouldn't be like the expansion of the child tax credit like do you think mark cuban is like this is all poor people need to do is open that money market deposit account like would he really toss everything else no, out? i never i never said that was all that he said I never said that was all I said, but that is the advice that we hear again and again and again, like avocado toast guy, who then was like, oh, we got to crash the economy because these poor people are uh, Hold on, the avocado food. toast guy wrote that article like, I think eight years ago, and you guys have been complaining about it every well, single yeah. day ever since. I don't think we hear that advice all the time. I think the advice you generally hear most often repeated is go to college. Go to college, get a degree. That's your, your number one way. When we talk about like expansive um, wage gaps between working poor and, and educated people, that's driven by the income, the wage premium granted by college degrees. I feel like that's the advice I hear. I've heard, if, if I could take like seriously the number of times in life I've heard somebody say, don't buy avocado toast versus the time somebody said, go to college and get a degree. I've heard the latter five million times more than the former. But it seems like people just want to obsess over that one article because it, I don't know, it makes them feel good about themselves or they can blame other people or... Well, it became it became part of the zeitgeist. Like you, you talk about, you hear it once. Like it became part of the zeitgeist. That's why people talk about it. But no, no. Like, but it, it's it not like rich people were talking about. Like if you oh, if you buy, I listen. I could be totally wrong. There's that there's that book called it's called like what Rich Dad Poor Dad or whatever. I'm willing to bet without ever having read that book. I'm willing to bet that the majority of the advice in that book is not about not buying avocado toast. I'm willing to bet that if you look at, um, you brought up Dave Ramsey, um, all these other financial people, I'm willing to bet the vast majority of their advice has nothing to do with buying avocado toast. The avocado toast thing was literally made by, or it was it was propagated and became part of the zeitgeist because millennials and, and Gen Zers wanted to obsess over it. But the vast majority of wealthy people aren't saying that this is the way, I'm pretty sure they talk about like avoiding depreciating assets, don't use debt like a poor person, meaning to get into more debt, manage 
manage your credit responsibly and go to college and get a degree. That's always going to be the majority of the advice, but nobody wants to hear that. And they want to focus on the avocado toast meme, which is literally a meme. I think everybody agrees that that guy is an asshole. Nobody takes his advice seriously. In fact, when you look at the article that he'd written, I think he actually is an asshole. Like he's trying to rage bait people into talking about like his crazy shit. No, well, but just because you don't believe that that is part of the narrative, that has become part of the narrative. Just because of that one article, that is ever that has become part of all kinds of articles where they're like, well, the actual issue is millennials don't spend their money well, and so that's why they're not going to retire. That's why they only have 4% of the wealth. That's why they only have this, that, and the other. Like you said, that has not been the reality that I see at all. I mean, I'm sure you hang out with much wealthier people than I do, but that is not the reality that I've seen. That is not, that has become part of the narrative is these lazy millennials who don't know how to spend their money, who never actually had access to the money that their parents had access to. But we never talk about that part. We never talk about how millennials are worse off than their parents financially do and have less disposable income. We, we never talk about that. So and that's never part of it. It's, Millennials are destroying this industry. Millennials are destroying that industry. Millennials because they don't have disposable income. No, I, 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 I actually have fully rejected this. I don't think that's true. I think that there are meme headlines that like millennials like to blow up on Twitter. But like, if you ever read the Wall Street Journals, if you read the Financial Times, and maybe I miss these articles because I don't read as much as I could. But usually, when I see like educated people talking about millennial income issues, the two things that I see talked about the most in well-written articles are usually the rising cost of education, which is a huge one, and the rising cost and the unaffordability of houses or rent in major cities. I, I've never read a Wall Street article, like well-written piece, that's like, here's why millennials suck, and it's because they buy too much stupid shit. Like, I, I know that there are every now well, and then, like... Every now and then there'll be like an article with a headline like that and then like the, it's a dumb article and it goes viral on Twitter. But I feel like the vast majority of the analysis of millennials and why they're having financial troubles is because, oh, I'm sorry, it's three things. Is It's the unaffordability of housing, the rising cost of education, and it's the fact that a lot of millennials enter the job market in 2007, which sucked right after the big housing boom and everything. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's not, it's so not that, the case. That is yeah. what I said earlier. It's, I mean, that makes my point. It's systemic issues that is the reason there is less wealth there's not less wealth because poor people it's expensive to be poor like like that that's what i said i said the issue is the high cost of education and if we could manage that that would greatly improve people's prospects and outcomes like that, I, that's what i said uh -huh. or housing yeah i housing agree with in that my area is okay oh i but housing in my area is ridiculous. It increased really quickly because of people moving here from California and wages have not kept up. Mm -hmm. Like like people have to move from this area who have degreed jobs because they have no hopes of buying a home in the next few years in this area. Like I understand that, what you're saying and I agree. Being able to there has to be huge changes, but it is so disempowering that the only advice we can think of to give to poor people is like wait for huge systemic change. There has to be other advice that's okay to give. There has to be other things that people can personally assume responsibility and autonomy over other than telling them like, sorry, you're totally fucked until the whole system changes. But that's not that's not what I said is that's the only advice. That's never been what I said. That's like a straw man you made of what I said. That's not what I said. Okay, well then I'll ask again. If but you could I give said, advice to poor people, like what is the advice you're giving them to like improve their financial positions? Well, I mean, is this I'm giving a TikTok or I'm giving like actually a huge like here, here's what's going on. Here are things to think about. Here are things. Yeah, to like a, let's say 5,000 poor people just click followed on your TikTok because you said the next TikTok I release is going to have two or three points of advice for poor people. What would the advice be that you would give them? I would talk about the importance of education. I would talk about the importance of, no, I, are you kidding? Like, of course I would talk about the major things. I'm not going to not talk about the major things because that is part of the discussion. Okay, no offense, but that just makes that, poor people feel like shit. <laughs> I, like, no, if, as a poor, I was a poor, what are you talking about? I was a poor person. Okay, I don't know and what that, your, no, I don't, I don't, I can't speak to your position, but when I was working, I was a carpet cleaner, my girlfriend was pregnant, 
and I had bills to pay. Going to school was not an option for me. So if I go on to like, here's some advice to improve your position as a person. Oh, thank God. And the first thing is to go back to college. Well, fuck me. I've got a kid on the way, a house that I can barely afford, and I'm working as a fucking carpet cleaner. That's like the worst thing to tell me. I'm not going back to school. My life is over. I, so there's got to be something else. There has to be things we can tell poor people for how to improve rather than like no, but- go to college. Yeah. No, I mean, like, are you, it's not like I was in a different situation. I had just left a fucking cult, had three children. I hadn't been in the workforce for a decade. My husband was making not a lot of money because we lived in fucking Missouri and they don't pay nurses shit. Like, it's not like I was in a different situation. I think it is a perspective thing. And I, I think it is like hearing, like, going to go to education. Yeah, no, I was like, fuck me. But I also knew that that was a rally. And I was lucky. I, w- I will, like, that's the other thing. Like, there's so much fucking luck involved in this. Like, let's be fucking for real here. I was lucky that I was able to go back to school. And so. Well, when I you say lucky, what does that mean? That. Well, wait, how were you able to go back to school? I was lucky because of my husband's job. He was able to watch the kids enough that we didn't have to pay for childcare. And I had, like, scholarships because I worked my ass off. And I think that is that is luck. That's work and luck. I think they're both huge factors. I was incredibly lucky that I was able to go back to school because I didn't have a support system. I was trying to learn how to be an adult outside of a high intensity religion. I like there was a lot going on right there. And there was a lot of luck that I had a lot of very fortunate circumstances that allowed me to go back to school that I know other people don't have. Sure, but like, so to be I, clear, I got, hold on, I just as lucky. a, my inner atheist is coming out, okay? When, you, when You're saying lucky, but it doesn't sound like there was a whole lot of luck involved there. It sounds like your husband worked really hard. It sounds like, I can't hear exactly, but it sounds like you're saying he had like a work from home job, so he was able to watch the children, and then it sounded like you. No, he was, he was, he was a nurse. Oh, okay, was he, he was on call nurse. or something? No, he worked, but I was able to get classes when, when... Okay, so, but it, it, it's sad. I mean, like, if he, I, I mean, my, um, my kid's mom's family has a lot of nurses, and the, the work hours for them and everything sound fucking brutal. So if he was able to balance out his work yeah. life, and you were watching kids, and you were working college at the same time, that's like, that wasn't luck. That sounds like you guys both worked really, really, really hard to make that work. And now you guys are enjoying, like, the fruits of your labor. And it shouldn't have to be like that. Like, there should be free childcare available so your husband doesn't have to work hours or you don't have to balance out weird schedules with the kids. Like, there should be better systems in place. But it sounds like you actually did, unironically, like, Sigma Alpha Male grind set busted your ass out of that circumstance with both of you guys working hard to do it, right? But I also, but I think... There has to be, I don't mean luck like, God bless us. That's not what I mean. I'm like, I'm an atheist. I mean, like, there is luck in having those circumstances because there are a lot of other women who leave Mormonism without education who don't have that ability. They don't have the ability to then go back to school and better their opportunity. There is, there is luck involved in being fortunate enough to have that happen. And I, I think that is important to acknowledge. Yes, I busted my ass. But people doing lots of jobs are busting their ass and then they get cancer and then they get like there, there were so many things that could have gone wrong that could have totally changed the story that I didn't have any control over. It just worked out. It did. It just worked out. And that doesn't happen for everyone like that. We have we know people who they were going through college. Family member got really sick. They had to drop out. Things just change dramatically in their life. That's what I mean by luck. I'm not saying I didn't work my ass off. Okay. But I also acknowledge that there were so many other things that could have happened or gone wrong in that circumstance that didn't. Yeah, I I agree that, in that when you're when you're poor, you can't make as many mistakes as a wealthy person, right? That when you're poor, one or two mistakes might end you yeah. and that might feel like the luck aspect. I don't disagree with that. But I'm when when you're in those situations and you can't wait for the big systemic change, I feel like I'll, I'll ask one more time because I'm so curious. I've asked you like th- tw- twice. This will be my third time. Is there no advice whatsoever that you can give to people who are poor 
And like how, I guess if you're saying importance of education, if you can have a partner working full time while you've got a chance to go back to school, which I think I would imagine is probably out of reach to most people. But if you could, sure, I'll give you that one piece of advice. Is there any like other advice you think is fair to give to people that are in poverty for like, hey, keep these things in mind and it'll like probably improve your financial situation, at least like materially, if not significantly? Well, like... Yes, I, like let me think, because I, I want to be like fucking for real here. I I probably teach them about a Roth IRA because if you are working a lot of these jobs where you don't have that, like that is a good potential investment option. And don't roll your eyes. I'm but like you don't have to have tons of money to invest in that right away. You potentially aren't going to have a retirement, and that is an option to have access to money that you could potentially use later. I think. You would want to talk about uh, ways to maintain your health because you probably have shit insurance. And so if something goes bad health wise, you're screwed. Um, and then, yeah, no, there's obviously like saving is important. Okay. Like, no, nobody's going to say you shouldn't do savings. I think all of those things would be really important. Sure. So I, 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 never, yeah, I, think, like, I think that's, yeah, I think that's fine. I think I largely agree. Um, yeah. Broadly speaking with what you're saying. So like, do you think it's ever okay to make a video saying like, hey, make sure you take care of your health um, because especially as a poor person, your health is very fragile um, in that like if something happens, you're completely screwed. Be mindful of your yeah. savings. Look into like IRAs or 401ks or whatever. Do you think it's okay to give that advice ever? Because it feels like that's basically all Mark Cuban was doing because it, it feels like that's more or less like just what he was saying, right? Don't spend your money on dumb shit. Look at Emma money market deposit accounts. Like, And I'm not saying it's never good advice to give. It's, I, I'm not saying it's never okay to give that advice. I, I'm not. I, I am saying, though, it's out of touch for a billionaire. In, in the last 40 years, to be saying that with what's going on. And that's, I know that you and I politically see that differently. I, I don't think we are going to change each other's minds on that. I, I don't like, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. I do think it's out of touch. I, I think it's giving, it's giving Marie Antoinette, let, let them invest, let, let, let them eat cake, like without acknowledging that there are major issues. Because I mean, like coming from, from my standpoint, I, I don't, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to say like, yeah, here's some things you can do. Obviously, obviously there's things people should do. And especially if it's somebody I know that hasn't been taught budgeting or about credit or so, of course, of mm -hmm. course I'm going to fuck it. Like, my own kids, I'm going to teach them about credit in ways I wasn't taught about credit. I'm going to teach them about ways to maximize any assets they have on and on and on, not to invest in depreciating assets, things like that. I'm going to teach them all the things I didn't know so that hopefully they can have a head start. I think that's important, of course. Who's not going to do that? But there are also some really like fucked up things going on for the lower class, for the working poor, for those in poverty. And I'm not going to sugarcoat that because, I mean, ultimately, I would like them to be upset enough that they vote and get active and try to change those things. Okay. Because Do you, does Mark Cuban, me, is he, like, against any of those things? I, I don't know. Well, because, like, you kind of made fun of him because you were like, like this guy calls himself the people's billionaire. So, I mean, like, it feels like... It feels like there's a lot of animosity towards him when we, I think we both acknowledge now he gave good advice. I guess he's a billionaire, so that's bad. And there's larger structural and systemic changes to make. But like, he's probably in favor of most of those things. That would be my guess. Because most, at least most billionaire people that are public facing seem to be like relatively philanthropic, relatively in favor of. I just talked to, um, was, I think, um, did Ro Khanna say that his district has like a ton of people that are in ultra high income brackets that are all in favor of like tax increases and everything. Mark Cuban, I'm just guessing because of his position on, um, uh, because of his position on healthcare and like doing the whole affordable drug program, he probably feels similarly, right? So assuming those are his political positions, like is it fair to say that Mark Cuban is a billionaire so he shouldn't be saying this because we have to address these larger problems if he literally has the positions that we ought to um, fix those problems like but here's the thing is the ultra wealthy could be addressing these problems like actually truly addressing them like how and 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 that's the thing like i mean 
let's look uh, let's look at the money in politics. Okay. I mean that's that's a great way to start talking about. Let's look at the money in politics. Okay. What let let's see who's getting massive tax cuts. Let's see who's getting corporate welfare. They, what is Mark Cuban supposed to do about changing. that though? Like money and politics um, came from that was a Supreme he's a, he's Court a, decision. A, like lobbying affects everybody across the entire economy. Like, what is a billionaire supposed to do about that? Like, are you supposed to? Ask, are you asking me what are billionaires supposed to do about the lobbying to get more welfare for the ultra wealthy? Yeah. Like, do you think I'm the Trump tax cuts? The Trump that. tax cuts didn't happen because they were popular with billionaires. They happened because the entire Republican Party likes tax cuts, right? Like, it wasn't just billionaires that got... The billionaires but, as a percentage like, made up well, but... Like, okay, are you... Do you really believe that the wealthy, the ultra-wealthy, were not lobbying for those tax cuts, did not actively want those tax cuts because they would benefit from them? From a financial or business point of view, I don't know if the ultra-wealthy care much about tax brackets. I feel like that the way that your income is structured when you're making that much money is things like tax brackets probably don't have that much of an impact on your on your overall earnings. That, that'd be my guess. Like you're looking at things like capital gains, which I think increased under Biden. Didn't he increase the capital gains for long term for the top brackets? Um, but also, I, I think it... Um, isn't Mark Cuban in favor of more taxes? I know that I've heard, I think Warren Buffett is in favor of, of more taxes. Um, well, so they say that, but like with the proposed billionaire tax, they are not in favor of that. And that would actually be a way to structurally change things. Well, wait, what is the and billionaire tax? So it was uh, proposed by, I can't remember his name, out of Oregon. Um, and what it would be is, if you have greater than one billion dollar in assets, or make more than a hundred million dollars in three consecutive years, then you would be the subject of this tax. So it'd be approximately 700, 750 people in this country. Um, and what it would be is, like, like you said, so it's not about income for the ultra wealthy. So we can talk all day long about what is their income tax rate. It doesn't matter that much. Like we could even make it 90 percent, like it was in the 50s. That's not going to ultimately change too many things because they don't necessarily take income like we do. They, they leverage their assets and take out loans or they do things to offset that, like sell their stocks and say their investments were a loss or give philanthropically because then they can it can offset what they made profits wise. So anyway, what this is, is that their tradable assets that they make these profits in um, that are valued annually even if they haven't been realized, so they haven't traded, they haven't sold, it wouldn't technically be taxed. They will be taxed on the increase of that. And I think it capital gains would go from 20% to 39.6. So it would go to the income tax rate. And I have to see. All right. so I believe all of those assets would be taxed at 39.6%. Okay. I don't know how you would ta I think you can only... I don't know how you would tax something without a taxable event. So, for instance, when you sell something, then you would look at the difference in uh, the appreciation of the asset, you'd sell it. I don't know about taxing something just as the asset appreciates, because then do you recapture that loss when it depreciates? Or that seems like it'd be really complicated. Well, that would be it. Oh, oh well, I mean, that's probably, you know, they hired more IRS, so I think we can do it. True. But then also you said that if this is something no, that's only like, affecting 750 people, is this even raising any money? Is this actually changing or helping anything at all? Yes, it would, just like I have to look, it would raise, oh, there was a figure for it. Let's see. It was in the trillions of dollars in the first year. No, and it, that, way, it would that be, is impossible. No, it was, yes. Well, no, because they could pay it over five years. That, I don't even think I would agree with would that be, number. That sounds, so the 750. Would be in the increase. You'd be raising trillions of dollars. You'd be raising trillions of dollars off of 750 people? Yeah, do you know how much money that they've made? Oh, just in the past, like the top 1% made 40, oh, I have to see the number. Like 42 something, something big. A whole bunch. Is this in the past three years? Let me see. 
Yeah, but we also have and to the keep richest one percent. The richest one percent increased their value forty two trillion dollars since twenty twenty. Sure, but now we're talking top one percent, which includes people making is that three hundred k a year? I think is top one percent in this country right now. So that's now we're broadening that massively from just seven hundred fifty people. I could believe that the number that you're saying is probably true, but again. Those are appreciating assets where you haven't created a taxable event yet. They haven't yeah. sold anything. Are you going to tax people on the appreciation of their portfolios without them actually selling anything? Because at that point, aren't you just basically forcing people to sell off like chunks of their investments and businesses to pay taxes that they, yeah. You aren't forcing anyone to sell anything. They, it is still wealth, is it not? Like they are still building wealth that then they can leverage. Well, yeah, but I'm saying that like if if I have, let's say I've got 50 million and then it appreciates by 5 million in a year, but that appreciation is just the increase of the value of my portfolio. And now you're telling me you're going to tax me like a million dollars. Do I have to start selling my assets to pay my tax now? Even if I haven't, if, I, if my portfolio is just increasing in value? They, I mean, you could leverage your assets. Um, so you're going to take out loans, a secured debt to pay off your, I, this is why I don't like, I feel like wealth taxes are just, pay off your tax burden. What? I mean, they take out, they take out, they leverage that to just like live day to day. How is that different than having to pay taxes? Well, because I mean, it, because for the taxes, your one is you're talking about like a really wealthy way to pay debt, um, there, there are ways that you can take secured loans against the values of your portfolio. I understand that. And that might be a thing worth addressing. But the difference is like you're telling somebody essentially that I don't know if you could take a loan to pay your taxes. I'm not sure if you I don't know if somebody would let you do that because I feel well, like it's some... a, they have five. They have five years to pay the initial burden. So, I mean, that's, that's the thing is it's not I don't think they would force you to sell. But you have up to five years to pay the initial tax. Yeah, but I mean, like, I'm just saying that you would, I, I, I don't want to get into a huge financial thing. I understand what you're saying. Here's my two issues with it, and then I, you can take this or whatever, because I understand. The, the one issue is that taxing people in the appreciation of a portfolio is weird if you haven't sold and created the taxable event, because one, now you're paying taxes on things that you haven't even cashed out yet. So for instance, let's say I've got a portfolio, it goes from 50 million to 60 million, a really good year. Okay, I appreciate $10 million, 20% increase, then I pay a ton of tax on that. Let's say next year sucks and the value of my portfolio plummets to $40 million. Well, holy fuck me, I just paid a whole bunch of taxes on the appreciation of my portfolio and now that money that I paid taxes on, I didn't even get because it's gone because my, my portfolio lost value. Do I get like a huge tax well, saving? Yeah. But this wouldn't even apply to you because it's people who make over a hundred million in appreciable value in three consecutive years. Yeah, sure, but like let's say so that so that wouldn't so that wouldn't even apply to you. So if, let's say you lost, you wouldn't owe that next year. You wouldn't know. Well, sure, but like let's say for instance, like, let's say somebody like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. Let's say that their businesses are growing are growing massively because they are, especially over COVID. Um, if the value of Amazon grows by some a billion dollars or whatever, should Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk be forced to sell off like huge chunks of their equity in their business just to pay their taxes when they haven't actually even realized any of those gains in income? No, they wouldn't. Specifically in the tax, they are not going to force if you have. Um, I have to look at it because I, sure. I have to look up the. Well, what I'm saying is because, again, like, but, when we talk about a billionaire making money, they're not actually like getting money in their account, right? It's just the appreciation of usually of securities. But they, right? It's still assets. Yes, but it's still assets that they have that they use to leverage, and it is building wealth, whether by investment or off labor. Like, it is still wealth that they are building, and that is a way that the wealthy and ultra wealthy have avoided having to pay taxes. Like, like their effective tax rates are like five percent or ten percent, and and that's the whole point is well, they have not strategies. Their, their effective tax rates, I think, are around. I think it's like fifteen to twenty five. I think depending on how you look at it. The, there is a big article. I don't know if it was the New York Post. I don't remember who wrote this. No, I think it was the Intercept. ProPublica. Pro oh no, ProPublica. You're Pro right. ProPublica wrote it. Yeah, where they tried to show that their effective tax rates were like for some people like one point seven percent. Well, no, like they're two, saying one percent, and yeah. that was not real. But no, that, that's because that the way that they calculated oh. effective tax rates is because they were looking at how much in tax a person paid in a year, and then they put that against the increase in valuation of their overall portfolio. But that's not like a fair way to 
to value because they're not creating the well, tax No, that's not how you yeah. value. Sure. No, that's but, not how you value it. But the entire point is Yeah. We're in a system where the effective tax rate for me mm-hmm. is comparable to the effective tax rate for people who make billions of dollars. But they're able to if I had like a really good year, they're able to um, leverage their wealth so they never have to sell or they say that they've had loss in their investments or on and on. on. There's all these strategies that they're able to use to pay significantly less in tax. So I don't actually even care if Warren Buffett is like, absolutely tax me more. But that's not what's happening. And sure. that that's effectively like you can say that all day long. Like, you, I mean, you can say anything you want. You yeah, because I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to the voters, real, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I just yeah, and so to circle all the way back, I just I feel like shitting on Mark Cuban for giving good advice just because he's not single handedly like overhauling the tax system. I feel like it's fair for him to give the advice. I feel like it's good advice. I think if if you want to like fight the system or attack the system or say that our system's not fair, I think that's okay. But like shitting on a guy that's giving a good advice, where I'm pretty sure it was even like a response to a question that he gets in his TikTok. I think that's how he does some of them is people ask questions and then he responds to like for people asking for advice or whatnot. I I just feel I don't like I think such a, that was a question. Was it not? I thought that I thought that he does like on his thing. He but does the like smile. The smile one was. What okay? Oh, the smile one was. Okay, maybe maybe that one in particular wasn't. But I mean like. It just, it feels like there's, it feels like we're creating a problem out of nothing. Like, there's no problem here. He can give advice if he wants. If you want to, like, rage against the machine and fight against the system, I think that's fine, too. But in the meantime, like, everybody can only maximize their own individual decision-making as much as possible. And uh, if people give advice to people to do that, whether they're billionaires, millionaires, or thousandaires, I don't see the problem in that. Other than it's tone deaf, I guess, as you would say. (laughs) I, I would say, depending on who it is, I do think there's a tone deafness without 